a reading from the first book of Kings. At that place, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites, Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altar, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. And the Lord said, Go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now then, there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a sound of sheer Silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altar, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When he even came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land. The wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed that the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the good news of the gospel. Praise you. What a joy it is to see all of your faces this morning as we are gathered together. Um, it, I, I think we could stop right now and I would be happier than I've been worshiping with you all for four months. So it's really, really good to be with you. As, um, we, as I prepare to preach and as you prepare to be with me as we meditate on the scriptures, I invite you to join me in prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on this place. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. So as some of you uh, may know, because you've heard me talk about them, I grew up on Disney movies. 101 Dalmatians was my absolute favorite, but I made the round through, rounds through all the oldies but goodies, Cinderella, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty. Now over the decades, Disney has changed how the heroes and later the heroines behave. In the first half of the 20th century, Prince Charming always st stole the show, coming in with his handsome, strong presence to save Cinderella, Snow White, and Sleeping Beauty, the beloved damsels in distress. In preparation for this sermon, I took it upon myself to watch Snow White, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty again, a great procrastination tool, and it brought much joy to my heart. Were the heroes as similar and caricatures as, as I remembered? What I discovered when re-watching the films is that while the little creatures, the dwarves and the mice and the fairy godmothers are even more delightful than I remembered, Prince, the Prince Charmings of the original Disney classics are actually even more flat than I remembered. In Cinderella, the prince doesn't even have a first name. He only says 50 words out loud and he's barely a part of the film. In Snow White, the prince, who does have a name this time, also barely speaks. He only says 15 words out loud in the entire film, other than one song he sings right in the beginning. He swoops right in in the end, though, and when Snow White does, barely even knows him, he saves the day, waking her from her slumber. In Sleeping Beauty, the prince has a very similar role. He's similarly strapping, similarly white, similarly brief, and similarly largely unknown to Sleeping Beauty until he steps in and saves the day. For those of you who are also fans of animated films, you know that of course, some things have changed since the 1930s, 40s, and 50s when these Disney classics came to be. Today, Disney films like Frozen, Moana, Coco have sailed away from the Prince Charming narrative arc, highlighting stories that lift up different types of heroism and happy endings. Yet even though Disney has shifted away from this simplistic Prince Charming-like hero, I've realized that my caricatures of what to expect from heroes who save the day has largely remained the same. When I feel like my back is against the wall, I want a Prince Charming to swoop in and just turn everything around. I don't need to know who's saving me. I don't need to have an active role in things getting better. When I feel stuck or alone or as if nothing will ever get better, I want my own version of Prince Charming to swoop in and save me. Can anybody else relate? <laughs> And in a revealing way, I've started to realize that I just don't want a Prince Charming like figure in my wife or in my family. A lot of times when things aren't going well, I want God to be just like Prince Charming. I sometimes wish Jesus was just like Jesus in the children's Bibles I grew up reading, looking like the Prince Charmings I had internalized. Superman Jesus, Prince Charming Jesus, strong and handsome and always able to turn everything around at the drop of a hat, Jesus. But as many of you know, Jesus didn't live like this. And he also didn't look like this. He wasn't a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white, Olympic athlete-like man. He was a Palestinian Jew, a brown-skinned man who was rejected by the authorities of the day, not heralded by them. A man who shared his power instead of holding it close and then coming in right at the end to save the day. He didn't swoop into people's lives like a paternalistic savior who knows better. Instead, he came to people in need, where they were, when they needed him. When they didn't even know they needed him. He came to the marginalized, the sick, the forgotten, the seeming lost causes. And he spent time with them around dinner tables and along wilderness paths. And when they felt out to sea or were literally out to sea in today's case. And he comes to us in similar ways. He trusts us to make decisions even when we don't want to have to choose. He doesn't control us or control the world. And he doesn't swoop in and promise that we will never struggle. Today's gospel reading is a good example of this. When we come to the disciples, they'd had a really long day. They'd suffered the loss of their friend and companion, John the Baptist, who had just been executed by the state. 
And even though the day turns around when they miraculously fed the 5,000, which Ian preached on beautifully last week, their grief over, their loss, over the loss of their friend and mentor was still very fresh, still sinking in. When the end of the day arrived, Jesus took some time to take care of himself and rest, a lesson we, I think, could learn from too, or at least I could. He went to pray and grieve and seek guidance from God on his own. But before he did this, he sent the disciples ahead, trusting them to start the journey across the sea without him. And as the disciples began their journey, they realized just how tired they were. They were counting on having a smooth journey and easy crossing so that they might rest and sleep and ready themselves for the new journey ahead. There's always a new journey, right? But as we all know, just because we're in desperate need of rest doesn't mean that rest from our troubles is necessarily what we will receive or what we've been promised. For good fortune is not the fruit of hard work or struggle. That's far too simple for our complex God and our complex world. There's no promise of earthly prosperity when we do everything right. John the Baptist, the first leader who prepared the way for Christ, shattered this hope for the disciples. His life and his death showed that just because you do everything right, doesn't mean everything will go right. And that is a hard truth to swallow. So picture them in this place, tired, trying to process the horror of the morning and the miraculousness of the afternoon. And just as, about, as they're about to settle in for sleep on the boat, the wind starts picking up. The waves become choppy, crashing around the ship. And everyone is awakened and sent to their posts, manning the sails, tending to the water, sloshing into the sleeping quarters. I'm sure they thought to themselves, where is Jesus when we need him? Why did he leave us here? Why didn't he come with us? Couldn't he have predicted this? Couldn't he have prevented it? Where is he? I've asked these questions of Christ. Where are you? Why didn't you stop this from happening? Why did you let this happen? If you're so powerful, why would you allow so much pain and fear to persist? These questions, these instincts, these longings, they connect us not only to the disciples on that stormy night, but to the children of God from the very beginning of time. Elijah, the legendary prophet whose story is our Old Testament reading for today, is exactly at this place. He feels as if all of his work has been for naught. He's ready to give up. He feels lost and abandoned by God. And he pretty much tells God so, saying in his own way, I did everything right. I did everything you asked, but still now I'm all alone. Almost asking God, just as Job did and as many have before, how could you? When Elijah was in this place, <clears throat> he crumpled off as if pulling the covers over his head. We all know that feeling and hid. Then a great powerful wind came, but God wasn't in the wind. Then an earthquake shook the ground, the very foundation of the mountain he was hiding in. But God wasn't in the earthquake. Then a fire came blazing bright. But God, as you know, God wasn't in the fire. And then, then the sound of sheer silence. Silence surrounded Elijah. And when he heard it, he came to the mouth of the cave. It was the silence that beckoned him to the mouth of the cave. He got up, letting his cloak fall from his face, and he listened to God's sacred silence. And as he listened, he looked out past the cave doors, and he heard and felt God's presence with him. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have expected God to be in the wind. Or at the very least, the earthquake and the fire. I mean, these are grand and sudden, dramatic examples of Earth's ver own version of Disney's da da dashing Prince Charming. But that's not how God came to Elijah. Elijah didn't need to be swept off his feet, the display of sheer force and strength. He needed silence. He needed to feel heard. He needed to feel as if he was surrounded by something gentle, and present. 
And this, in silence, is how God made God's self known. Now fast forward almost a thousand years to Christ. When the disciples were in need, Christ didn't appear with silence in this case, but he still showed up in an unexpected way. As they were battling the storm, they saw a figure, a figure they couldn't recognize, a figure that frightened them. Their fear, as fear has a way of doing, blinded them, making their vision incredibly narrow. They couldn't, couldn't imagine that that could even be Christ as they needed him. They, like Elijah, might as well have been curled up in bed, protecting themselves from the scary outside world. But just like God surprised Elijah, Christ surprised the disciples. He came to them walking on water, and they couldn't believe it. So Peter, and we love Peter for this, he tested Christ, saying, that's really you, allow me to walk on water too. And as we know, Peter did. And though his doubt and fear caused him to sink right back down just as he was getting going, Christ was there, steady and present, literally reaching out his hand to lift Peter up. In stories like these, the disciples in the storm, Elijah at his wit's end in the cave, they help me as a Christian who sometimes feels like I'm bumbling around in the dark to feel seen. How often have we stood exactly where Peter stands, feeling as if we're trying to hold everything together, feeling as if we're trying to defy the impossibility of walking on water? How often have we curled up as Elijah did? When we find ourselves in these places, again, let us remember, our Savior and God is not Prince Charming. God doesn't swoop in and make hard experiences or painful memories suddenly disappear as much as we might want God to work that way. Christ doesn't eradicate world hunger or expunge hate and fear from political discourse at the drop of a hat. At least that's not God's usual style thus far, but you never know with God, right? But our God does show up. Our Lord is with us, joining us when we're curled up and stuck in bed whispering in our ears with a still small voice, or even, even the sound of sheer silence. And our savior who could have the power to upend all injustice and eradicate all pain has chosen to empower us. We are not damsels in distress. We are beloved children of God with the image of God literally imprinted and implanted within us from the very beginning beckoning us to come out of our caves, to come out of our boats of safety, and to bring forth the justice and peace of God together. Maybe you don't think of Jesus like Prince Charming. Maybe that's just me. Uh, but what are images of Christ you're holding on to that you may be invited to be letting go of right now? What assumptions have woven themselves into your imaginings about who God is or how God thinks or how God moves? I'm grateful you see why to be able to unpack these things with you. And as we listen to this next anthem, um, the anthem is Be Thou My Vision, but it's arranged to a different tune by um, Bob Chilcott. So invite, I invite all of us to receive it anew, listening to old words with the tune many of us might know, might not know, some of us might. But let us listen and let God be our vision as we go forth from this day. Amen.
So good to see all of you here. It's now time for our prayers. So I invite you into a place of quiet and peace for just a few moments as we pray for ourselves, those we love, and our world. Let us pray. Thank you, God of grace, for getting us through this summer, which seemed so uncertain back in May. Thanks for all those who kept showing up for us. Thank you for our church that has pulled together and supported each other in so many remarkable ways these last five months. Thank you, God of wisdom, even for the technology that brings us together today, which still feels weird, but which is a blessing as it connects us each from our own home. When we get frustrated with virtual church, virtual classes, or virtual work, help us remember that the medium is not the message and that you will find a way for your spirit to speak. We pray for our Yale students, faculty, and staff who face a daunting set of choices and a list of unknowns as they come to the start of this new year. We're anxious to meet them, but also anxious that we all stay safe. Give our university's leaders wisdom and compassion to make hard decisions. Give every student confidence and patience and a deep knowledge that they are loved by you no matter what. And give us all hearts that can open to welcome all those seeking a new spiritual home. As we pray, give us the courage to face the reality of 5 million COVID cases in the US and 20 million worldwide. 162,000 dead in the United States and 725,000 worldwide. We pray in silence for a moment for all the sick, all the dead, and all those who love them. The numbers are so huge, Lord, help us not to lose sight that each one is your beloved creation and our sibling in Christ. Guide and strengthen the scientists, the healthcare workers, and all those who are working so hard to preserve life and health. Jesus tells us over and over again, do not be afraid. Trust in God. Jesus faced opposition and suffering and showed us how to do the same. Give us the grace to seek again each day the peace and trust you offer us. We ask your blessing on each person Zooming in today. Bless our university, bless our nation, and all the peoples of the world you made with such creative joy. And now, let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. If you wish, unmute yourself, and we'll hear the many voices. Uh, or in your own uh, silent prayer, uh, we'll say together the Lord's Prayer in whatever language or translation is closest to your heart. Our Father, who art in heaven, in heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we have given to us our trespasses. We have given to us our trespasses, and we have given to us our trespasses. We have given to us our trespasses. Amen. Amen. And our last hymn is Precious Lord.
Whew, what a joy it is to sing with you all. Of course, it's not the same as being in Mattel, but that brought so much joy to me. Uh, huge thanks, um, a couple of announcements to Sherry Pantaki, who has been working so hard to um, adapt our choir throughout the summer. Sh is Sherry still here? Yes, she is. Sherry, it's amazing, amazing work, um, what you have done. Chase, uh, you on the organ and the piano, uh, it, it's just amazing. Um, we are also very, very thankful for um, Sophia uh, Campamore, who has been editing all the videos and putting them together. She's been singing in our choir for a couple of years now. She's not here this morning, but it's just amazing how we adapt. And so thank you so much. Uh, we're very excited. Megan Stoll is here this morning as well. She's going to be coming on as our new um, choir director soon. And so Megan, know that we are very excited for that as well. Um, a couple of other quick announcements. So the school year is coming quick and with joy we are anticipating this. So August 23rd will be our first um, student welcome service where we'll welcome our graduate and professional students and the 30th will be our college student welcome service. So mark your calendars, be ready to greet them with joy. Um, if you are a new student and you're uh, watching this later, uh, please reach out to Ian Oliver and email him and we will happily send you one of our um, wonderful UCY t-shirts. But now let's join together and say our wonderful words from Micah chapter six. Um, it, you can find it if you go to the bulletin, which Jessica has put in the chat for us. Um, I invite you to unmute yourself if you wish. It will be messy, but that is also, God is often messy, so that will be beautiful. Um, okay, let us join together. <clears throat> With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself. Bow myself. Bow myself. God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what and is the Lord for you. But to do justice. To, to do, do justice. justice. To love kindness. To love, love kindness. kindness. And to walk humbly with your God. To walk, to walk humbly, humbly with, with our God. God. Amen. 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 Go now with the grace of God, with the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which surpasses all understanding and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. For go now in peace. We will listen to a postlude. And um, for those who would like to, we invite you to join us for coffee hour directly following the postlude. Go in peace. Yeah. <laughs> 